someone who I believe will probably uh, carry the heaviest burden uh, in, to, in today's uh, question and answer session is Dr. Fasi Khan, a respiratory specialist at Leicester General Hospital. Uh, Dr. Khan plays an important role in the British Islamic Medical Association, known as BIMA for short, an organization that has worked extremely hard in the background, putting their own personal time and effort, vis Allah, to look into, to research, to decipher the issues um, uh, facing the Muslim community. And up until now, we never had an organization of professionals within the medical profession to uh, look at uh, these issues and, and spend their time uh, and come up with substantive responses. So Dr. Fasi, Jazakallah khair for your time uh, to Minab and this session. The format of today's program is, is fairly straightforward. Um, I'll be ans asking the questions which uh, Minab has already received. And during the program, there may be other questions uh, that would be posed. So ultimately the aim of the program is to inform the community and uh, so that they can have enough knowledge to be able to make a decision for themselves uh, after this session, uh, insofar as the vaccine safety and um, issues concerning the uh, misinformation uh, it, uh, that is being put forward. Now, because this is a Minar platform, I think it would only be fair to dive right into um, the issue of halal and haram. And we understand, Dr. Fussy, that uh, there are uh, three vaccines uh, that's out there, Pfizer, Oxford, uh, Zeneca, and the Moderna vaccine. First of all, are they all available to the public? Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Thank you to Minab for arranging this webinar, and thank you to our participants who have tuned in, in, in this evening. So... Yes, there are three vaccines that have been approved by the MHR in the UK. Of course, we had the Pfizer vaccine initially, followed by the Oxford AstraZeneca. And more recently, the Moderna vaccine has also been approved. Currently, as things stand, the Moderna vaccine is not being administered, but that will probably change in the next couple of months. So yes, all three are available and all three vaccines are halal. So there's, there's been a huge amount of misinformation that's been circulating right from the beginning. And, you know, we've heard all sorts that these vaccines contain pork, these vaccines contain human cells, you know, monkey DNA, all sorts of things. So somebody, you know, people have just been making up things because it sounds good and it's been spreading like wildfire. The reality, we've obviously got Professor Waqar here who can talk about the ingredients in a bit more detail. But the reality is that the Pfizer vaccine certainly contains your genetic material contains your fats, which make, up, make, make, which make up your nanoparticle, salts, sugars, and salty water, nothing else. No fetal cells, no human cells, no animal cells, no pork, no gelatine, no alcohol, nothing of the sort. Okay, there's absolutely no doubt about it. The Moderna vaccine is very, very similar. Um, uh, and I must say that, I mean, the, the data for the Moderna vaccine was published more recently. The, the British Islamic Medical Association have not yet scrutinized the data yet. So I probably will talk less about that vaccine and more about the other two and particularly more important as they're actually available. In terms of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, um, again, there, there is, you know, no, there's no, you know, DNA of animals or anything of the sort. The vaccine, the virus for the vaccine was cultured in cell lines from fetal cells. Now people hear that and they become very, you know, shocked all of a sudden, this contains fetal cells in it. I mean, you know, it's really important for me to explain this. Most, a lot of vaccines, so this includes the MMR vaccine, this includes other vaccines as well. The virus for the vaccine is grown in cell lines, which originate from an aborted fetus from the 1970s. That does not mean to say that the vaccines actually contain fetal cells within them. What it also doesn't mean is, and, and so, so you grow the virus in the fetal cells and, and these are cell lines. So these are duplicated multiple times. And once the vaccine is produced, these cells are washed away. So the final product does not contain any fetal cells at all or any cells uh, from the fetal cell line for that matter. But there is a very, very small amount, 0.02 micrograms or milligrams, sorry, of ethanol in the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, 
but you know the BBSI and other scholarly bodies have approved this halal. Um, you know, it's a very minute quantity, and these quantities are found in a number of other products. So to summarize the answer, and there's a lot of information there. There is no fetal cells, there's no animal cells, there is a very, very small content of ethanol, specifically in the AstraZeneca vaccine. There is no gelatine, and there's nothing else that would render these vaccines impermissible. The question that is asked sometimes is, is it halal to take the vaccine? And there are two basic principles that we need to look at here. The first is, what does it contain? And the second is, what does it do? All right, what does it do both positively and negatively? Now, this question is about the first of those questions. What does it contain? Is it in and of itself, does it in and of itself contain any ingredients that are impermissible for a Muslim to consume? Um, in this, and I'll, I'll speak about this a little bit later, I think, but you have to consider where we get our facts from. And I think one of the concerns and one of the issues that we have with this particular question of vaccination is that people are relying upon different facts. Now, the fiqh follows the fact. So where you get your facts from will determine what the fiqh response is. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about facts later on. From the fiqh perspective, however, we've been informed by the people whose responsibility it is to determine these things for us for all our medications, for your paracetamol, for your, for your mum's metformin, for your, for your granddad's aspirin, all of these medications, it is from the, H, uh, the MHRA that we, we get the information about what it contains. Uh, as Dr. Fazir has said, it contains no impermissible ingredients in terms of gelatine, et cetera. No, not, none of the three, there are no animal products in any of the three vaccines. The question of alcohol, um, there, are, there is no alcohol in the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. The, 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 the point about this 0.0025% ethanol in, um, uh, in, uh, in the AstraZeneca or the Oxford vaccine, um, there's more alcohol in your loaf of bread than there is in this vaccine. So uh, there is a principle in Sharia, which is al-qalilu kal ma'adum. That which is vanishingly small, the Sharia treats it as though it is not there at all. All right? And so on that basis, the vaccine, no, ni none of the three vaccines are nejis. They are not, they do not contain impermissible substances. So from a Sharia perspective, all three vaccines are acceptable. Absolutely not. It's scientifically implausible. So the, the vaccine contains what we call mRNA, which is messenger RNA. So this is, this is new technology. It's, it's been tested actually in the rabies vaccine since 2013 and has been developing in the background for the last decade or so. But it's the first time it's actually been approved for a vaccine that's been rolled out. And essentially what the vaccine does is it contains the messenger RNA, which is a signal. So it goes into your, your cells, your body's made up of millions of cells, and it goes into your cells and it, it gives the signal for the spike protein, which is the protein on the outside of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19. So it makes the body, you know, it gives the body this illusion that SARS-CoV is present, even though it's not the live virus. And the body then responds to that spike protein by producing antibodies antibodies, there is no way that mRNA actually enters the nucleus of the cell where the DNA is actually kept. So that's scientifically implausible. So if the mRNA cannot enter into the nucleus, it can't alter your DNA. So absolutely not. The vaccine cannot alter your DNA. So what we know from the studies um, is, so this is probably I need to go into a little bit of detail here, because I suppose this is a question about the safety of the vaccines. So what we know from both, all three studies actually, but we'll focus on the Pfizer and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. So in the Pfizer trial, there were almost 44,000 participants, half of whom received the Pfizer vaccine, and the other half received a salty injection. And in the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, there were 11,000 participants, half of whom received the vaccine, and the other half received either salty water or a meningitis uh, back injection. And in both these trials, patients were followed up for at least two months in the Pfizer's trial and three and a half months in the Oxford AstraZeneca trial. And what they found is that the rate of serious adverse effects was the same in both the vaccinated group and in that group that received 
salty water, the placebo group, and there were no safety signals of concern. And this was the same in the AstraZeneca vaccine. The only very slight concern, and I say it's a very slight concern, is there was one case of a condition called transverse myelitis, which is inflammation of the spinal cord. Now, it is unclear whether that incident was related to the vaccine or not, because the remaining five and a half thousand participants did not have a problem. And it's also important for me to add in that one patient, he or she, they have recovered or they are recovering. And so, you know, it, it wasn't permanent, uh, the injury. So um, going back to, you know, trying to uh, answer your question, what we know is that actually in the short term, these vaccines are incredibly safe. There was nothing to suggest that actually these vaccines cause side effects or serious side effects. Now, what we don't know, and this is where we have to be honest with what we know and what we don't know, is we don't have the long-term data. So in an ideal world, we would, would want at least two years and probably more of follow-up data to establish how safe is this vaccine in the long term. However, the important part for me to add here is what we also know from multiple of the trials in the past is that your side effects normally occur in the first six weeks, normally. So actually that's very reassuring. So we know it's safe in the short term. We're not sure if it's safe in the long term, but we're almost 90, you know, we, we, we can't, we don't have data, but we're very confident it will be safe in the long term. So with everything, it comes down to risk benefit. And therefore, because pregnant women and breastfeeding women weren't included in the trial to err on the side of caution that advice was given. But pregnant women and breastfeeding women are now receiving the vaccine. So actually it is safe in these groups. And we're, you know, millions of people have been vaccinated across the world and there haven't been any you know, recurring problems that we've heard about. Then the, the, uh, anybody that receives um, the conspiracy theories or videos or information, uh, how should they react to it uh, and what's their obligation? Can they forward that message on? Uh, what, it, what is their position uh, under Sharia? So from, from an Islamic perspective, our religion is distinguished from all other religions in the world uh, by one really important thing, which is verification. Our religion, the, 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 the landmark or the, or the, the really the, the signpost of our religion is its verification. When we, 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 read, we recite the Quran, we know that this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited and we can prove it, what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited in, 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 in Medina. Uh, we know when we talk about a hadith, when we talk, we throw these phrases away, this hadith is sahih and this hadith is hasan. What does that mean? It means that it, even a hadith, this is, this is, oh, brother, that's a da'if hadith. Right? It's a weak hadith. What does that mean? It means that it has gone through a process of verification. Someone, experts have looked at this, have determined, is this something that is accurate that I can rely on? All right, And then they grade it. This is something that we should be proud of in our religion. We are very, very good at verifying information. And we as Muslims need to apply this not just to our religious practice, but to our daily practice as well. Now, do I go and verify a hadith before I quote it? No. Do you go and verify a hadith before you quote it? No. You rely on the verification of experts. So I don't, I know, I never met Imam Bukhari. You never met Imam Bukhari. How do you know that Imam Bukhari was reliable? Because everyone says, or the vast majority of people say that Imam Bukhari is reliable, okay? So there is such a thing as expertise in verification. Now, when you ask a scholar a question, Sheikh, can I do this, right? The scholar gives you an answer. That answer is based on the information that the scholar has. However good the information is will determine however how close to correct the answer is, all right? So if you have a, so, so the, the scholar will ask, what is the fact? Tell me the fact and I will work out the fiqh. All right. How do you verify fact? This is the question. Now, the issue that we have today is that all of us are bombarded all the time with what seem to be two different versions of reality. 
there is the, the, the mainstream narrative and then there is this other narrative as well. And we do not have the tools to sift out fact from opinion, from fiction. Because there are three separate things here. Fact, opinion, and fiction. All right? Here's a fact. One person in that trial, as Dr. Fassi said, got this particular horrifying sounding condition. Here's an opinion. It was caused by the vaccine. Here is a fiction. Because Bill Gates wanted to kill that person and so put uh, nanoparticles into that person's particular vaccine. Now you have here a fact, an opinion, and fiction. And these three are not the same as each other. Now, what do we do here? We as Muslims, I'm not asking, and I'm not saying that you should try and go and verify facts yourself because you don't have sufficient you know, the expertise to do so. It takes expertise to do it, all right? I don't have the expertise to verify fact and fiction in this case, because I don't have, that's not, that's not the role of a scholar. But there are people for whom it is their role to determine what is the fact, what is an opinion, and what is fiction. And what we are asked in our religion to do is rely on those people. Allah says in the Quran, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُ if you don't know, then ask the people who have the expertise, all right? And these are, these are the people, some of whom you see on your TV screens. Now, I get that there are a group of doctors or you know, people with big titles behind their names who are saying the opposite, all right? So you have 99% of people saying one thing and you have 1% of people saying the other thing. What do you do in a situation like that? you have to go with the majority. The 1% would need to demonstrate very, very clearly, not to you and me, not to you and me, but to the other experts, why their position is the correct position. All right? Because it is very easy for me to take any position whatsoever. For example, the US elections were, were rigged. And I can present you with one side of the story. I can present you with 10 pieces of information to show you why the US elections were rigged. If you don't have access to the 100 pieces of information or the 1,000 pieces of information or the critiques of those 10 pieces of information, obviously you will believe what those facts lead you to, all right? So we need to be, we need to be very, very careful about this. Please be careful. The responsibility of a Muslim is to determine where expertise lies, place your trust in that expertise, and then be very careful about what information you pass on to other people. That, that, that puts a, a very kind of clear position um, uh, insofar as nanotechnology and chips is concerned. So there are um, um, nanotechnology chips which are being used, but in this particular um, uh, situation, you're, you're, you're categorically saying that that can't be used um, and naturally, you're also going to say that it's not going to be used. But if, if theories are out there, and, and this is really to debunk a, a lot of the questions uh, which are coming across, that if ever there was um, a risk, what mechanisms are there within the science and medical uh, professions? Uh, for example, ethical uh, codes of conduct, uh, committees, uh, there's a whole process before authorization uh, is given um, what kind of processes are there to safeguard the public? So any kind of research that goes on in the university, even if it's uh, doing a questionnaire for people, it has to go through an ethical approvals committee and so many people look at it. So even before you start any kind of research, it goes through this uh, ethical, ethical committees. So basically it's very hard to get anything through these committees that's going to cause uh, danger or risk to the public. So the, every, every, all the research is scrutinized before it actually happens. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the only little point I want to make first, just pertinent to your previous question is, I mean, referencing Bill Gates and microchipping is, I mean, you know, the obvious thing here really, just moving away from anything medical or science is, you know, we all carry mobile phones and, and really, if anybody wanted to track our movements and if anybody wanted to control us, 
you know, our mobile phones would be perfect for that. And, and we are probably being tracked through our mobile phones. So, you know, it's, it's, it's quite absurd that, you know, somebody needs to inject us with a microchip to somehow control us. But to answer your question, so I run a, I run a clinical trial here in the UK. And so I'm very familiar with some of the processes that Professor Waqar alluded to. So when you set up any study, and this is in the UK, in America, any part of the Western world, you go through stringent processes. You have to justify every little thing. So you have to justify who's going to be working on the study, what their conflicts of interest are, where the funding is coming from, what exactly are you going to be doing to the detail that even if you, so when I set up my study, I wanted to take 42 mils of blood, but on my form, I put 40 mils of blood. They refused. I had to go back to ethics for those extra two mils of blood in my patients. So every process is scrutinized where you're going to publish it, how you're going to analyze the data, what's going to be in that product that you're measuring, you know, who's going to have access to the data. You know, all of these things are regulated with the highest level of uh, scrutiny. And these are independent bodies. These aren't friends and foes who are helping. This is an independent ethics committee who look at this. These are, there's a number of independent bodies. And with the vaccine, it was no different. So the vaccine, when it was developed, went through all the same processes that any medicine, medicinal product goes through. It was scrutinized. And then eventually at the end, the data was independently verified. So, so you know, obviously going back to Sheikh Hassim's point earlier, the, the public don't understand the level of scrutiny with all of these things because they don't deal with it. But we certainly know as physicians, doctors, researchers, that every little thing goes, a, goes through a huge amount of scrutiny. And if I wanted to cut corners, or if I wanted to play, you know, if I wanted to uh, engage in foul play, I just wouldn't be able to do that. It, it's not possible because of, of the processes we have in place. And this is something in the last three or four decades. I mean, there is a history, and I think people, you know, use that history in pharmaceutical companies to, you know, to, to, to essentially broad brush, broad brush approach. So what we do know, pharmaceutical companies have an agenda and the agenda is money. Of course it is. But what we're not asking the public to trust the pharmaceutical companies here. What we're asking is the public trust the independent bodies, the independent scientists, the independent doctors who have verified the processes, who have verified the data and we're not justifying the behavior of the pharmaceutical company, but we're vouching for the product because of our, our understanding of the processes. Sorry, I know that was a bit long. Okay, I'm going to bring in uh, Sister Salma Yaqub here. Um, clearly, there is a problem. We've got the experts uh, who are saying that um, there is a process, there's committees, uh, there is scrutiny uh, that goes through all this. Um, yet, the public uh, seem to be very doubtful. Um, do you think this is more to do with the current climate that we're in, uh, Sister Selma Yaqub, in so far as uh, uh, not trusting governments based on what has happened historically? You've got the Iraq war, the Grenfell, Hillsborough, Brexit lies, and things like that, and Trumpism. Do you think that plays uh, more in the hands of conspiracy theorists uh, and therefore they apply the same principles here? Uh, or is there genuinely uh, more to it than this? First of all, assalamu alaikum, and I'm so proud and honoured to be part of this panel. Um, you know, at the beginning of this pandemic, um, I felt really heartbroken um, when I saw that the first 10 NHS doctors who died due to COVID happened to be Muslim, you know, from Asian and African backgrounds. Um, and also we know from all the figures in this country that uh, Muslims are being disproportionately impacted as patients, uh, we know that Pakistani and Bangladeshi communities are um, three threefold impacted compared to white communities and African Caribbean communities up to fourfold. So th this this is a real thing because at the beginning of the pandemic, many in the community, never mind when it comes to the vaccine, but when it came to COVID and getting ill in itself, were were, were saying, "Oh, th this thing isn't real." And I can tell you here in Birmingham, um, I'm not here on the panel as an expert, as a medical expert, but I'm speaking from a community point of view, but my day job is in the NHS in, in the mental health field. And I know how we've had to redirect so much of what's happening because we're seeing not just so many ill people, but so many deaths from a community perspective. I can tell you, we can't even cope with the number of janazah that are going on right now. 
um, Amrath volunteers um, with, with the local mosques, you know, to get trained in PPE to help families because um, there's, you know, how things about to change even with the mechanics of burial. You know, th this thing's happening and, and it's serious. Uh, and the other point I'm, I want to make um, before I answer your question is the sense of pride of being on this panel, looking at my fellow panelists. I mean, we have here a professor of nanoscience, Professor Akar Ahmed, you know, you know, everybody here is very humble in how they're coming across and we can forget their expertise um, and we should be getting a lot of reassurance. And as, as, and as I said, a sense of pride um, about that. We have Dr. Farsi Khan, who's an expert in respiratory medicine. So, you know, very, very um, skilled and, you know, what he's got to say and what he's said to us about the biology in this is something we have to take very seriously. And Dr. Asim Yusuf, you know, yes, he's here um, as Minab, as a spiritual leader, as an Imam, but he's also medically qualified. So, you know, I, I want to congratulate Minab in um, really bringing together experts who, who can give us um, some really informed insights. Um, and from my perspective, from a community, social, political perspective, I think very um, real, very important questions are being raised in the community. And I think you just dismiss everything as conspiracy theory, just as we've heard evidence base is important, keeping a critical and open mind is important. Um, and sadly, because as you pointed out, Moeen, people have been lied to on a large scale within our living memories. There is now a lot more political mistrust of leaders. You know, with the Iraq war, we were told categorically about weapons of mass destruction about to be unleashed in our country, which justified you know, a war abroad, which of course also resulted in, in, in tens and thousands of deaths. And as you pointed out with Brexit, you know, various campaign pledges uh, and there was scaremongering about the Turks invading us, um, you know, how many you know, thousands were gonna come over if we didn't have breakfast, never mind the kind of um, lies around the NHS um, figures of 350 million pounds a week, which would be put into our NHS service if we have Brexit. So. If people weren't cynical, there'd be something wrong with us, I think. I think it becomes dangerous when we confuse that healthy scepticism and every democracy and every healthy society should have mechanisms whereby people can ask questions and address things and have different perspectives and weighed up. And I think this webinar is a really, really important contribution to that, to help people make those um, informed choices and, and very clear principles have been laid out, I feel, this evening as regards consensus, whether it's religious consensus or scientific consensus, as, a, as an underlying principle of, of how we um, arrive at our personal decisions. So I'll share with you in terms of my personal um, thing. And so as I said, this is not me speaking as an expert, but facing the very dilemmas that you know people are you know questioning in the in the chat. I live next door to my mom, she's in her 70s. Um, I encouraged her and she has taken her vaccine last week. Um, of course, you know, I had a lot of those concerns in the background, but I, I, I feel convinced on a personal level that any harm that may um, come about, which could be from any medicine, you know, every medicine will have its um, you know, side effects. That's why any medication you see, you'll see the long list of side effects. And you know, if you were to look at it, you'd think, I wouldn't want to take the medicine because, you know, and, and even then they're graded in terms of the possibilities of, um, of, of various reactions. So for me, it was weighing up what are the likelihoods with the evidence so far. And I personally am convinced enough to have said to my mom, and you know, I can't get give a better endorsement than that, you know, that's my you know, very close loved one, that on, uh, on balance, that's what I would recommend. And I would say to the youngsters, as the vaccination comes down, you know, to, to, to kind of younger and younger people, I feel it's a responsibility, just as it's been a responsibility to wear our masks, to socially distance, to isolate, to protect vulnerable people, that, that you know, having the vaccinations and getting that kind of wider herd immunity, which obviously has had a bad press up till now, is important. You know, many years ago, and this is the irony I find with Muslims as well, um, may, maybe some people don't know, but way back, you know, even before Jenna, you know, in the 18th century, um, it was Muslim, Muslims in the Ottoman Empire who actually introduced inoculation. And um, there's an example of Lady Montague in 1717 writing um, back saying, oh my gosh, you know, these, the, these Ottomans are doing this, you know, that they're, they're, they're introducing 
um, these, well, they wouldn't use the term bacteria virus, but a, a strain of illness in order to inoculate uh, the population. And she made sure that her son had it when he, when she came back to England and actually introduced uh, a form of inoculation, slightly different from vaccination, you know, getting technical. But at that time, the church and the local people were up in arms about it, saying, oh, this is the Muslims are trying to um, get, you know, sit, you know some, do some kind of sinister activity to take over the country, you know, before the Brexit argument about the Turks invading. So, you know, there's always going to be questions when something new is introduced. But I think as Muslims, you know, we, we have a proud history when it comes to medicine, when it comes to science, when it comes to weighing up um, the, the, the benefits against the risks. Um, uh, and so this is something that I think that we should be, you know, championing, we should be questioning, but also where we know and we are reassured that we should feel unafraid about um, going out and giving that assurance to the people. And again, the irony that um, the, the couple who actually invented the vaccine, which is being rolled out uh, in the majority at the moment here, happen to be Turkish Muslims. Um, so, you know, in all the kind of xenophobia and Islamophobia, because of course, at the moment, you know, different communities are being blamed. I remember the Eid fiasco when we were told that these Muslims are spreading COVID and it's because we're being irresponsible around the mosques and a few hours before Eid, you know, Eid was shut down. Um, and now again, we're going to start seeing a bit more of that rhetoric as things get out of control. We know minority communities and right now, Muslim communities on the front line get targeted in that way. Young people are demonised, you know, the students, university students were blamed for a little while. I mean, this last few weeks, it's been um, the social media influencers flying to Dubai who are the baddies and the super spreaders. So we're gonna we're gonna see some of this politicization in, in the communities. Um, but what what we know does work, even outside of the vaccine, if you look at countries like Taiwan, that actually this was brought under control by having a rigorous test, trace, isolate, and support mechanism. So just basic public health approaches. So we know that that is important. That's something our country hasn't got right. So I think questions about rolling it out and the bigger um, kind of context still have to be addressed here. And from a civil liberties perspective, you know, I would still urge that people be um, allowed and people not be discouraged and no draconian laws be introduced to stifle freedom of speech, because I think that will only just um, make people even more cynical um, and there will be a reduction in the uptake. And for this to work, we need at least 75% of the population to take it up for that immunity to work. And we know with polio, we know with smallpox, we know with measles, and we've all taken those. I don't think there be anybody on this panel who hasn't you know, had some of uh, that kind of immunization and, and our kids, because we know it works. And we know that some you know, genuinely you know, life-threatening diseases, which literally affected millions of people, have been more or less brought under control or even eradicated because people are prepared to take, go into this new terrain uh, and now it's normalized. And, and, I, and I think this coronavirus vaccine will, will, will go the same way. And I don't think there's been a, a more scrutinized um, kind of introduction of some kind of medication than this. Um, uh, and so politically speaking, my own kind of instinct would be, be very difficult for them to slip anything into this, which would be um, along the sinister lines that some people are claiming because it's so easy for that to be exposed um, at this moment in time and the political consequences for governments or even businesses who would who may have tried to get away with it on the quiet and i don't dispute that where when people see profit and some benefit they may all try shortcuts they may try some form of experimentation but for that to happen on such a large scale in the full glare of scrutiny from grassroots level to scientific institutions to government, to political organisations, I personally can't see that happening. That's a very valid point. And uh, an example was something uh, someone gave me, uh, was a, a Muslim pharmacist. He's been given the task of um, vaccinating uh, over a thousand um, people. Um, and he says, look, Moin, I, I can get these vaccines and I can get them assessed and tested and, and um, looked at uh, uh, privately. And can you imagine the um, reputation of the government and all these big organizations if it was found that there was something there? So th there's too much of a stake here, as you say, uh, Sister Sama, that, uh, that something like this could potentially happen. It's, it's highly unlikely, yet the conspiracy theories are there. I'm just looking at uh, 
and I'm conscious of time as well, we're, we're past the nine o'clock, I'm trying to bring this to an end, but uh, I want to particularly refer to the Medicine and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, the MHRS, who say that no corners have been cut. Uh, and also the National Institute of Biological Standards, they said that every single vaccine that goes out uh, it, it has been ensured that it meets the standards. Um, but uh, I'm referring this because one of the questions that have been posed whilst we're on, uh, on there is that, um, uh, is that um, uh, a shortcuts have, I mean, I think Dr. Fussy has answered this already, but because of the speed of the, um, uh, of the vaccine being created, um, uh, have there been any shortcuts taken um, and uh, can you reassure that there's uh, nothing that will damage um, or, or there's nothing negative that might come out of the vaccine? Dr. Fassi, I think you're on, um, you're on mute. I, I apologize. Uh, Sheikh Hassim, I think you wanted to take this question, did you? Uh, I, I was just, it was just, the, the, you see, a lot of people are asking the question of, has this been rushed? Okay, uh, which is a very fair question. All right, that's a, that's a perfectly fair question. Um, so, and I want to use this to illustrate a point I made earlier. Uh, the trials happened very quickly is a fact. The trials have been rushed is an opinion. Now, it is important to distinguish, as I said before, between fact and opinion. All right. Um, because opinions can be challenged. It's much more difficult to challenge facts. Opinions can be challenged, however. This drug is effective. Ivermectin, I saw on one of the, uh, someone mentioned on the chat, Ivermectin. I've seen research on Ivermectin. Um, um, now, it is effective, that's an opinion. It it, it, the trial showed one, two, and three, that's a fact. So distinguish between the two, that's the first thing, all right? Secondly, in terms of rushing, and I know, you know, people talk about, the bureaucracy and the money and the this and the, and the stages being pushed together and all sorts of stuff. And, and let's be honest, right? I mean, like I'm only a psychiatrist, okay? I'm not fancy doctor like these guys are, right? So a lot of this stuff goes over my head as well. All right? Um, the psychiatrist honest, community will be, will be speaking to me after this. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure there will be. Uh, although tell the psychiatrist community that, that, that they're meant to let you speak to them. Um, so, so, um, just, um, I'll give you a simple example. When I was 16 years old, my friend, a uh, very interesting friend I had, and he, he was doing a project with his dad at weekends and that project was building a car and it took three years. Yes. He and his dad built this thing called a kit car where you could buy pieces and you just put it, you assemble it in your garage. And he, I remember I went for a ride with him in his kit car. It was a big thing. It was a culmination of three years of work for him. Took him three years. Why? Because him and his dad in his garage, and he was saving up his pocket money to buy each of the different bits. All right. Now you compare that to Toyota. You can put. You compare that to Jaguar Land Rover down the road. There's billions of pounds in it. There's hundreds of employees. There's people making all the different parts of the car together, uh, and then it all gets kind of mashed together with. It all gets mashed together at one go. It's much much faster. It's much much more effective. All right. The reason for that. Is, this, is that the different parts of the car are being made all at the same time and then you put together. And that's only possible because there is so much of money that is in it. Now, when Dr. Fassi was talking about this research project he wanted to do, that's poor old Dr. Fassi and his little, little, you know, little, you know, no offense, Dr. Fassi, you know, his little, you know, his little mom and pop shop, um, uh, uh, you know, research project. He doesn't have big money behind him. He hasn't had government saying, you know, this is urgent. We're gonna smooth all the red tape for you and, 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 and so forth. Because the fact is, some red tape is important, but the really the reality is, a lot of it is not important. Whether poor old Doctor Fussy took forty mils from a patient or forty two mils from a patient, that doesn't make any difference whatsoever. It's red tape that's there for the sake of red tape. What's happened in the case of the COVID and the trials with COVID is that a lot of the red tape has been removed. A huge amount of money has been put into it. There's a lot of people, a lot of brains, been working on it together at the same time. It's not my friend making a kit car in his garage with his, with his dad. It's Jaguar Land Rover. And that doesn't happen for a lot of medications. The reason it's happened is not just because drug companies want to make money. Of course they want to make money. But it's not just happened for that reason. It's happened because there is a worldwide emergency, guys. This thing is not a joke. 
20 members, myself and my wife, my families are in South Africa, 20 members of our extended family have died with COVID so far. So far. We, we've had situations where we've had, BBSI have had to issue fatwas about mass graves, burying Muslims in mass graves, like this is wartime. This is not, this is not unknown to any of you here, guys. All of you will have had family members that have passed away from this. I had COVID and I recovered in three weeks, all right? I'm not worried about me. I'm worried about my mum. I'm worried about my dad. Some of you are worried about your grandparents. I'm worried about my elderly neighbors on either side of the road. I hear that, don't forget in all of this concern about the vaccine, forget the concerns about the vaccine, weigh that up against the concern about COVID. Not to you, if you are young enough and IT equipped enough to be on a Zoom webinar, then you're not the one who's really at risk from COVID. Your mum who hasn't figured out how to use Skype yet, and who thinks mobile phones are this are, are witchcraft, that's the person who's at risk. And those are the people we need to protect. And we need to consider that Allah has said in the Quran, one who saves a life is as one who has saved the life of all mankind. Don't worry about Bill Gates. Don't worry about AstraZeneca. Don't worry about Nadim Zahavi or any of those people. The virus is here. It's killing people. It's not gonna kill you, probably, but it may well kill an elderly member in your family or an elderly or the uncle G in the masjid, all right? And ask yourself, my, when I took the vaccine and I videoed myself having the vaccine, all right? When I took the vaccine, I said, I am taking this, not for myself, I am taking this for the sake of my community. Might it harm me? Maybe. All right, might I have a sore arm? Maybe. But if by doing this, one elderly, I can save one elderly person's life, that's good enough for me.